Hello and welcome to episode number four of CS350 Online. I'm your host as always, Leslie Eisted, and in today's episode we're kind of going to wrap up our discussion of threads. We're going to go over some threads examples and then we are going to do some threading sample problems which should help you out a lot with the threads quizzes. And if we still have some time, and this episode may actually end a little early, uh, then we are going to take a little brief tour of the pthreads library. Um, and the reason for that is I want you to be fin vaguely familiar with it because when you work on assignment one, that's the threading library that you're going to be using. So again, just to remind you, there are quizzes on uh, Learn. Please don't wait to do them. There are, you know, something between 12 and 17 little questions. They're not too bad. They're open books, so plenty of time to do them. But you don't want to leave them to the last day of classes because if you do that, then you might run out of time and things like that. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is I think we have the assignments zero submission process back up and running. I think we actually got it back up and running on Tuesday night. I apologize for the delay in getting that working. As I mentioned before, just before classes started, probably in the last week or two of April, the first week of May, um, they were making a lot of changes to the school service, which actually uh, broke a lot of things. <laughs> and our submission server is one of the things that broke. And unfortunately, until a bunch of students, it, like it may work for us, but we have different permissions. And then when a bunch of students start submitting, that's when we realize, oh, there's something wrong. So we apologize, but it's uh, it's been back up and running for a few days. Now, for those of you who are looking ahead at assignment one, um, that should be posted and up. And it should be posted to the website already. If you're still having tr uh, troubles accessing the files, please let us know, and we'll. Look into it again, and the submission for that will be is it should be up as well. Um, and assignment one, so assignment zero, you were working with uh, OS one six one. In assignment one, we're going to take a break from OS one six one, and we're going to have you do some threading and synchronization work in the real world. So solving some very simple problems just using the pthreads library, which is why we want to actually take a look and see, hey, what's this pthreads library about? Okay. So our OS of the day today is called MCP, or Master Control Program. And this was released in 1961, and it's a product of the Burroughs Corporation. Um, and now Burroughs has undergone a number of acquisitions and sales, as so many other companies have. Um, it's also known as things like Unisys ClearPath MCP. And what's kind of neat about this operating system is it's been under development for a really, really long time. And you can actually find MCP emulators for like your web browser, so you can actually play with MCP in a web browser. I think it's kind of cool. Um, this, so there's a picture of a borough system down here below. And again, these early operating systems, the one thing you should take away from them is they ran on computers that were the size of rooms. Um, and your smartwatch is probably more, 10 times more powerful than it. But you know, this is, this was like 50, 60 years ago. This is a long, long time ago. So MCP was actually the first operating system that was written in a high level language. So if you're looking at the operating systems that kind of preceded MCP, most of them were written in a low level assembly language. And I know for most of you, you're not big fans of writing assembly code. And I've written lots of assembly code in my life as well. I don't mind it so much, but it is very, very difficult to read and follow. And one of the things we want when we're working on a really large code base is it's really important that the code is easy to read and follow because if it's not and there's a bug, it's going to be really hard to track the bug down. And if you want to make some kind of update or maintain it, it's really, really hard. Uh, but MCP was actually written in a high level language and the high level language it was written in is one called ESPOL, E-S-P-O-L. And you've probably not heard of that, but you might have heard of the language which it was constructed from and that's ALGOL. Um, and so ESPOL is actually Burroughs own variation slash extension to the ALGOL programming language. Now, of course, I'm going to assume that most of you have not actually touched the ALGOL programming language either because it's somewhat dated, but um, there you go. Actually, true story, if you really want to make yourself, like in order to get a co-op job, you kind of want to set yourself apart 
from all of the other applicants. You want to have a skill that nobody else has. And a really rare skill these days that's surprisingly valuable is being adept at these legacy languages. So Fortran in particular is surprisingly useful in industry, especially if you want to work with space industry or work with governments. Fortran is super useful. But another one that is really, really useful and very few young people know is COBOL. And it's apparently a really difficult language to learn because they tried to make it read like English sentences. And, you know, it's one language I actually haven't taken an opportunity to learn yet, but I should. <laughs> um, I can tell you I have learned another language many, many years ago called Inform 7 that is actually, it's a language that you essentially write an essay in. It's, it's very strange. Um, <laughs> And it's, it's surprisingly difficult to express things and read this code. But yeah, become a COBOL programmer and you'll make yourself surprisingly useful around the world. All right, so this was written in SBOL anyways. Um, now, another thing that this operating system supported was multiple processing units. So instead of having a single processing unit, you could actually have multiple processing units and the operating system would know what to do with that. That means that if you had a list of jobs, then you could actually feed jobs to each of the processors, which means you actually had a degree of true parallelism actually going on here, which was really nice. And you also had multi-programming as well. So not like preemptive concurrency, but you know, better than nothing. They were also um, the first operating system to commercially implement um, something called virtual memory, which is essentially abstracting the user program from physical memory. Because, I mean, have you ever noticed that every single one of your programs, their address space goes from like zero to the end? So, yeah. If every program has the exact same range of addresses, how does that work exactly? Well, it works because they're fake. Um, and this operating system was one of the first to actually do that. All right, so it did actually, it, this operating system is very, very important, by the way, in terms of firsts. Uh, it had a journaled file system, which is a very modern idea. Of course, this didn't come out in 1961. This came out in a later version. They had high-level job control. They had ports. They had all kinds of interesting things. And one of the really interesting things that they did is, in order to have this operating system, you had to purchase Burroughs hardware. So Burroughs was like, you know what? We're going to give you the operating system for free. And because you've spent all these multi-millions to buy our hardware, we're not just going to give you the operating system. We're going to give you the source code to the operating system. And that meant that users could actually, when there was a bug, they could go through the source, create a patch, and then distribute it to all the other Burroughs users. So in some ways, this is almost the beginnings of that kind of open source like community where you have people uh, submitting patches to each other and, and sharing little things all because they have access to the source code. So it's kind of neat. I think it's kind of neat. All right. So let's go back over where we were yesterday or Tuesday, whatever day it is. I don't know. I got to admit. Over the last year, the days all kind of blur together. So we were talking about this, this concept of context switches. And the context under which we were talking about that is the fact that we want to share our CPU, our single CPU, between multiple threads. And we want to give the illusion to the user that all of the threads are making progress so that the user believes that these things are actually running at the same time. Okay, question on Twitch. It's cranberry juice. That's what I'm drinking. I don't normally drink cranberry juice all the time, but yeah, it's cranberry juice. Absinthe, by the way, for the people on Twitch, is not red. I think it's like a milky green color. Not definitely not red. <laughs> yeah, no, if you're wondering what do I usually drink, I usually drink lemonade, uh, but I'm actually pregnant right now, and uh, lemonade is making me not feel so good. <laughs> so 
cranberry juice. There you go. All right. Anyways, we were talking about uh, context switches. As what's can happen is we have all these threads that want to actually share the CPU, but since only one can do it at a time, and we want to give the user the illusion that they're always all making progress, we're going to rapidly switch between them. And so the context switch is the act of switching between a thread that is running and a thread that is not running. So we're going to have to save the complete context or state of the thread that was running because we don't want it to know that it is not running. We want it to this to happen without the thread ever being aware. So we're going to save its complete context onto its stack. And then we're going to load the context of the new thread onto the CPU. So it's continuing from exactly the position where it left off before. Of course, if it's a brand new thread, which is entirely possible, the context will be, hey, I'm a new thread. I'm just running for the first time. Um, and, and that's, we have the code for that as well. So to do this volunteer, so the context switch um, happens when you, so there's two functions that we use. We use thread switch to choose the next thread to go, and it performs the caller save and caller restore. And then in order to perform the callee save and callee restore, we have this assembly function called switch frame switch, and it performs that low level callee save and callee restore. And the reason why we need this low level one is because if we just tried to do it in thread switch, it wouldn't work because the conventions are that the caller will only save the caller save and it won't save the callee save ones before you're using them. So we have to actually write an assembly function to do that. I mean, there are other ways around it. For the record, we could have done some inline assembly, but you don't want to do that. My house smells like bananas and I have no idea why. And I really, really hate the smell of bananas because I don't like bananas. <laughs> All right, so question on Twitch. Is there a function called context switch? I mean, not no S161. Uh, we don't use that. We use um, thread switch. That's what we use. But that might exist in other um, operating systems. I'm not sure what the name of the function is in the Linux kernel. I mean, you can download the Linux kernel code and look if you want to see what it's called there. Although I will say that the Linux kernel code is quite a handful to read through. <laughs> All right. So there were four reasons why we might actually have a context switch just to review them. One is thread yield. Thread yield is initiating a voluntary context switch. You are saying, I would like to give another thread a chance to run. Now, the interesting thing about thread yield, and this is really important, not just for OS 161, but it's actually important for uh, threading in general, is that yield does not guarantee a context switch. Um, there may not be any other threads in the system. There may not be any threads that are ready to run in the system. And there may not be any threads in the system which have a sufficiently high priority such that they could go next. So thread yield in practice is not a guarantee that you're going to initiate a context switch, but thread yield can yield a context switch. It just doesn't guarantee it. Uh, thread exit is always going to initiate a context switch, of course, because if a thread is terminating because we want to maximize our CPU utilization, we want to make sure that when a thread terminates, we have another thread to run on the CPU right away. Uh, and the same with threads blocking, that is to go to sleep to wait for something, the CPU would become idle and we don't want that to happen. And then the final case is when threads get preempted, and that's because we're doing the time sharing implementation where we want the threads to share a single piece of hardware. And we showed you this lovely little diagram before. It's, excuse me, very, very simple. What I'd like to do now is at the very end of these slides, we have... Uh, an example. I think this is. Oh, this is the one. This is the example at um, starts on slide twenty three. So just to reiterate, we we like to talk about what goes onto the stack after certain operations occur. So when you get preempted, what's going to happen is you have all of your stack frames. And then immediately after your stack frames, you get that timer interrupt because your quantum, your scheduling quantum has expired. 
So the clock is going to fire that interrupt, which causes us to regain control of the CPU. And now the kernel is going to run. Before it can check to see which hardware device through the interrupt, we have to save this thing called the trap frame. And the trap frame, remember, is we are involuntarily stopping the thread. This is not a function call, so we can't take advantage of caller callie save. We didn't call this function on purpose. This is the CPU that is uh, call, letting the kernel know that an interrupt has occurred. So we need to save every single register in the system, and that means 0 through 31, and it means all of the special registers like a low and high as well. After we've saved that trap frame, we can finally run the interrupt handlers. And it's going to start with a very generic interrupt handler to just try to figure out what kind of interrupt is this. And then from there, it'll figure out which device it was and then which device interrupt handler should be called. And we'll get into the timer interrupt handler, which is part of the clocks interrupts. And the timer interrupt handler will be like, oh, I see your scheduling quantum has expired. Well, we better call thread yield because if you want to initiate that context switch, then the way to do that would be to do thread yield. Now you might be like, but I want to guarantee a context switch. Do you? Because what if there's no other threads to run? Then you can, then you don't want a context switch, which is why we call thread yield. Thread yield will initiate a context switch if it is possible. But if it's not possible, it's going to let you just keep running. And that's totally fine because if you're preempted and there's no other threads, then obviously you don't want to like just sit out for a cycle. You want to actually keep running. So we call thread yield, which calls thread switch and thread switch calls switch frame. So here's the actual example. It starts on slide 24. And what we have is two threads. We have our root thread, thread one, and thread one likes to just run. It, has, it doesn't block, it doesn't terminate, it doesn't voluntarily yield. If my two-year-old was upstairs right now, he would say, you are rude, thread. He likes to tell people they are rude. People things, dogs, the squirrels outside the window. So yes, this is the rude thread, thread one. And then we have uh, thread two. Thread two is the friendly thread and thread two executes cooperative concurrency in the sense that it is going to periodically volunteer to call thread yield and give another thread a chance. So right now thread one is running and thread two uh, is ready, but has run before. And that's why there's stuff on its stack. Now, while thread one is running, a timer interrupt occurs. Comment on Twitch, squirrels can be pretty rude. Oh, I'm very aware that squirrels are rude. Every time I plant melons or pumpkins or corn outside, they come and dig it up. But uh, they got a nasty surprise this year because I planted them with about a cup of cayenne pepper. They don't like that. <laughs> All right, so the timer interrupt happens. And then immediately the CPU stops and it's like, oh, interrupt. I don't know what to do with it. Colonel, you better fix this for me. So we're going to switch and we're going to execute the interrupt, the generic interrupt handler in the kernel of the operating system. And before we can actually check what kind of interrupt it is, of course, we have to save the trap frame, which is the current context. So we put the trap frame down. And once we've stored the trap frame, then we're going to run the generic interrupt handlers and then the more specific ones. And again, this little turquoise aqua color box here, we will fill this in later. Right now, we're just going to leave it kind of blank. But when we talk about processes, we'll fill this in in great detail. Our timer interrupt handler is going to realize that this thread has exceeded its scheduling quantum. And so we're going to call thread yield, which calls thread switch. And that calls switch frame. Now, the first half of switch frame is saving the remainder of your own state. And the second half of switch frame is loading half of the new threads state and then popping the new threads switch frame off of its stack. So you'll see here that the switch frame executed by thread one actually restores and pops the switch frame off of thread two stack. 
and then immediately thread two starts running and it's going to start running by jumping back to the return address and executing from there and the return address was thread switch thread switch is going to restore the color save registers and then thread yield will will go back through all those things and then finally after thread yield has popped off thread two is back to executing what it did originally and then if thread two eventually calls um, thread yield again so we'll have a thread yield get called right here that calls thread switch and then switch frame and then remember switch frame is going to save the callee save registers and then load those from the new thread in this case that's thread one and then pop the switch frame off of the other thread stack and then now thread one is running and we return to thread switch returns to thread yield we return to the interrupt handlers, which are really just going to immediately return. And then we're going to restore the trap frame. And then thread one is going to go back to running the way it was before. Now, a question that I often get about this particular example is, aren't we saving the state of this thread twice? So you'll see here you've got trap frame, which we know saves every register. And we also know that between thread switch and switch frame, we also save every register. And so the question I always get is that, didn't we just save those exact same things twice? And the answer is no, you didn't. Because the trap frame is saving what the program was doing before the interrupt. And the thread switch switch frame combination is saving what happened immediately before that, which means thread yield and the interrupt handler. So it's saving things that the kernel did. So even though it looks like we're saving the same information twice, we actually aren't. We are saving two very different things. And the trap frame will always contain the saved state of whatever was happening before. And the thread switch switch frame combo will save the context of whatever was happening before. And running kernel code is what was happening before. Now the question on Twitch is why can't thread switch and switch frame be just one function? Technically speaking, they probably could be one function, but in order to make it work, you would actually have to have thread switch use a lot of inline assembly to, and the reason for that is because we, the register saving conventions that are obeyed by both the compiler and the operating system would have thread switch only save half the registers before it used them. So if we wanted to save the other half of the registers before we use them, then we would have to manually do that. So we would only either have to do uh, inline assembly directly in the thread switch function to do that, or the easier way to do it was to just do in a single inline assembly call and have um, that little bit of callie, call, callie save, callie restore, register work done in just the, the switch frame function. So there, yes, they could be part of the same function, but it would be really ugly because inline assembly is really ugly. Really, really ugly. All right. So hopefully that kind of walks you through what's going on here. If you are on Piazza, and if you're not on Piazza, please sign yourself up for Piazza and get, get in. And I will get all these unread posts. If you look in the pinned post, there's this extra sample problems and lecture content. And you'll see here we have some extra content uh, regarding context switches. So there's some extra reading that you can do there that you might actually find helpful for this particular section. All right. But what I would like to do now then is... Um, I'd like to do a couple sample problems. So if you're following along at home and you have access to the handouts that are posted in that Piazza thread, um, open up the one called fork print. Okay. So fork print.pdf. So I've got it open here now. And um, what you see here is a little bit of pseudocode for OS161 to create some threads. So we've got this helper function here. Oh, I hate calling things that. Um, but I guess that's what actually this function's named. And uh, we are going to, for each time this function runs, we are going to fork two new threads. And each of those threads is also going to run helper. And then we're going to increment the value of i each time that we do it. And the question is, given this little snippet of code that you see here, of the following outputs, 
which ones are possible and which ones are not. So here's one observation I want to make before we look at this, each of these little numbers here. The first thing you'll note is that the second parameter to the helper function, this i value, if i is less than 3, that's when we're going to fork. And if i is not less than 3, then we're, so let's say I, if i is equal to 3 or i is equal to 4, then what's going to happen is we're not forking any new threads. And for the person on Twitch asking, where do you find this file? If you go into that on Piazza Extra Sample Problems and Lecture Content, scroll down to Extra Sample Problems, and there's a handouts.zip. It's in there. The other thing I want to point out is that if i is equal to 0, we are going to print a 0, an extra 0. And because before we, if i is equal to 0, before we thread fork, we're also going to print a 0. OK. So now let's take a look at each of these here and try to determine which are possible and which are not. And of course, my tablet has fallen asleep. So let's wake it back up. There we go. Now, I'm going to do this in OneNote, and just a word of warning, OneNote doesn't really work. Oh, uh, OneNote has a lot of problems on Apple, and um, I've tried a lot of other writing tools, but they also have a lot of problems, so we're stuck with this <laughs> for now. If my new laptop gets released, we won't be, because... I'll be using a different OS. But at this rate, I'm not sure that it's going to be released anytime soon. Okay, so let's look at A here. So A is this is 0, 1, 2, 2, 1, 2, 2, 0. And the question is, is that a possible output for the function that we had? And again, you can find that function uh, on uh, Piazza? And the answer is yes, this one is possible. So, yep, we can do that one. Um, you'll note that we have two zeros and we have two ones. And then because each thread numbered one would fork two threads with number two, we can see we have two ones and we have four twos, so that works out. The other thing we note is because we print before we fork, each one has only two twos following it. So what about the second one here? 0, 1, 1, 2, 0, 2, 2, 2. This one is also possible. And the reason why it's possible is the, zero, the second zero from the initial thread can print at any time. It could immediately print its first zero and its second zero before any of the threads that fork actually have an opportunity to print their code. And the reason for that is because, again, you don't have control over when the context switches happen, and you don't have control over which thread goes next. So you really don't know. The other thing is that because we have two ones right here, we can have behind them four twos. And you can see we have up to four twos. Now C, 0, 1, 3, 4, 2, 5, 6, 0. This one is not possible. And the reason why it's not possible is because we stop forking and stop incrementing i when i is equal to 3. So we will never see a 3 in the output. Then we have D. D is a little tricky. This one is also not possible. And the reason is we print before we fork. So we print and then we fork two, two threads. But here's an extra two. And the problem with the extra two is that we need to see thread, the second thread one needs to actually fork the next two thread twos. And it prints its one before it does that. And so we can't have this. This is not possible, this ordering here. 
That's, you can't do that. We have an extra two before we actually forked the other one. E0112222. This one is also possible. And the reason is you've got your two zeros, you've got two ones, and you've got four twos. And you'll note that for the two ones, they print it off together, and then there are four twos immediately following them. So there's no out of order here. F, we already talked about it's impossible to have numbers greater than two. So we know F is not possible. Question on which is why can the zero be at the end? Because it's entirely possible that when the original thread prints its first zero, that um, it gets pushed to the back of the scheduling queue, and then all of the other threads are able to not only run and fork and complete their run before the original thread zero actually comes back and finishes off its printing. So that's, in to that's totally possible. Again, you don't have control over which thread goes next. You don't have any control over that whatsoever. Then we have G. Oh, apparently my battery is low on this. Oh, wow. That's enough for today. Zero, one, two, one, two, 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 zero. This one is possible. And again, you'll see here we've got only one, one, and then one, two. That's fine because its other two is over here. And then we have another one, and then we have two twos after it. So that's totally fine as well. And then for H, the very last one, zero, zero, one, one, two, 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 two. This one is also possible. Um, again, we've got the ones going before the twos, the zeros going before the ones, so that's totally fine. All right. Now you might be sitting here like, man, how do you think about this? Well, it's a bit tricky. Some of the tricks that you need to do to solve a problem like this are look at the code and ask yourself, What's the stopping condition? And in this case, here's the stopping condition right here. Um, and that is when i is less than 3, we fork. But if i is greater than or equal to 3, we don't fork. So there's your stopping condition right there. So that's one of the things that you should look for in trying to figure out what would be considered valid and invalid output from the function. Now, the second thing we look at is where do you print in comparison to where do you fork? Because this would be a very, very different question if we printed after the fork as opposed to before the fork. So those are there's no magical one strategy I can give you for doing these. There's just some things I can tell you to, to look at. Now, a question on Twitch is, is there some semblance of a defined behavior we can follow to know what to typically expect, or is it totally random? You should assume that things are random. They are not completely random, but you are not privy to all of the different decisions that the kernel of the operating system is making uh, behind the closed door, so to speak. You are not aware of all the different interrupts and exceptions that are being thrown constantly. Um, you're not aware of all the different thread blocks that could be happening, the context switches. So it's just even though there is some, I mean, th there is some reality to predictable behavior, um, it really would depend on you knowing a lot of things about your system that you just don't know. So you should, for all threading pieces of code, you should assume that which thread goes next out of all the possible ready ones is completely random. And you should also assume that context switches can happen at any point. So don't be like, well, a context switch can't happen here because it just happened here. No, don't make that assumption. Assume that a context switch can happen literally everywhere. Okay? So, yeah. And if you're sitting there thinking, well, that makes it really hard to write code with multiple threads. Yes, it is kind of hard to write code with multiple threads. So another question is if we knew all the variables, could we know for sure? Not exactly. Um, because knowing all the variables isn't just knowing all of the threads and all the interrupts that are coming in. What if there's a stall, like a hardware issue on your computer? Um, memory accesses can, can mess things up. There's, it's, it's not really possible for you to track all of this 
it's it's just not <laughs> so you should just assume that this all just happens randomly <laughs> uh, another question I think it's a question sorry if you see me bending down here it's just because I have um, another computer sitting beside me and that actually has twitch open on it <laughs> So, uh, order of execution may change between threads, but the logical order of the code cannot change. Uh, for this example, more than two twos cannot appear before the second one. Yes, that's true. So the order of execution and where the context switches, that can ha you have no control over that. You should assume it's completely random. But the, the order of execution of the code isn't going to change. So it's always going to happen in the sequential order. So yeah, that, that's, that's true. All right, so that's one sample problem. I would like to direct you to a second sample problem, and this one's a bit harder, um, but I think it's fun. And this one, if I remember, is called two threads. And by the way, these sample problems that I'm showing you are actually previous midterm problems. So we're very, very open in this course about sharing our previous midterms, the questions and the solutions. And all of these problems actually come from previous midterms. And I know midterms is kind of a thing you've probably forgotten about because you haven't sat in the pack in fear with thousands of other people for like three hours. <laughs> but yes, once upon a time we had paper midterms. Um, so this problem, we have, again, a little snippet of pseudocode. So we have the code that runs for our i is 1 to n. We are going to do c milliseconds of computation, followed by s milliseconds of sleeping. Remember that when you are asleep, you are not ready and you are not running. You are blocked, which means that you cannot be selected to run until you have completed your sleep. And this for loop is going to run n times. And um, we have two circumstances. And what we want to know is if there are two threads in the system, at what point will both threads be finished? And it's very easy to think we don't need to include the sleep time, but you absolutely, because if it hasn't finished its sleep, then it hasn't actually finished running. So in the first situation, if the compute time is less than the sleep time, and then the compute time is less than the scheduling quantum. We want to know when two threads will finish this little snippet of code. And we're always going to make the assumption that thread one or thread zero, whichever you want to do, if you want to play MATLAB and start counting at one or you start counting at zero like a regular person, um, that thread goes first either way. So let's open up a new page here. And we're going to need some lines. So let's do some grid lines. That could be nice. Grid lines. Hopefully the battery in my tablet will last as well. All right. So let's kind of trace through this problem here. So what we have is we know that for this particular problem, Compute is less than sleep. So for A, C is less than S, and C is less than Q. Now, here's the little thing. If the compute time is less than the scheduling quantum, then this thread will never get preempted because the scheduling quantum is bigger than the longer than the period of time that this thread would actually be doing computation. So we're not going to have any preemption here. So that makes life easy, right? All right. So here's how I like to do this. One of the things that you can do is you can draw it out. Now, when we have asked this question on midterms, and we've asked this one on similar ones on midterms all the time, we won't expect you to give some justification. And you're probably thinking we're expecting some kind of weird proof. No, a drawing is justification. And in fact, we recommend you draw it out. What I like to do is I like to, instead of drawing boxes, I like to represent each of these things by letters. So I'm going to let C be equal to two X's. And it's not that it's C is equal to two. It's just I want to use two X characters X to represent the box of size compute. And then since, oh, geez, didn't mean to tap over there. And then I'm going to let S be represented by three 
wise. I guess I could color, since I have grids here, I could technically do grids, grid coloring. And that's just going to make sure that we are using more space for the sleep than the compute. See, I could use this now. So we could do yellow highlighting, there's our two X box, and then we could do pink for the three Ys. However you wanna draw it, that's how you draw. So then let's do T0 and T1. And this is going to be time zero. Now, T0, the first thread is always going to go first. So it's going to go X, X. While it is running, the other thread cannot run, but it also isn't asleep because it hasn't even started yet. And then after two, the, the com computation has completed for the first thread, it's going to go to sleep for some number of units. And when it falls asleep, that's the point at which thread one can actually go. And what's really interesting here is when you get to the point where thread two, or thread one in this case, has finished its computation, the other thread's still asleep. And thread one needs to start its sleep. So you're like, well, do I wake up thread zero? No. They can both be asleep at the same time. This is nice doing this on graph paper because I can write the letters in the boxes neatly. Now, at this point in time here, after thread zero has finished its sleep, since the other thread is asleep, it can go back to com computing. And then it'll go back to sleep. And we'll just continue this pattern. Now the question is, at what point, how long does this take in total to complete both threads? Now a question on Twitch says, would our CPU be idle at cycle five when both threads are asleep? Yes, our CPU would be idle. Um, and in general, we don't want that, but we don't have a choice because there's no other threads in our system. Okay. So, how long does this take? Well, the first observation we're going to make is that thread zero never sleeps for any extra time. It's all, it, it goes from start to finish without taking any extra breaks. And we can divide its time like this. Now, how many times does thread zero execute the compute plus seep cycle? Well, it does it n times. So, we have n times c plus s. Now we look at thread one and we see here, when thread zero is finished, there's some leftover bits caused from thread one. And we need to know what is the length of that. Well, the length of that, since this is just an offset from thread zero, is going to be, well, what was the computation offset? What was the amount of time that elapsed between when thread zero started running and thread one started running? And that has length C. And so you get N times C plus S plus C. And that will be how long it takes for both of these threads to finish running this piece of code n times. It's pretty cool, right? Sorry, my pen keeps falling apart. All right. So that's part A. Part B is a little different. So the same question, but now S is less than C, but C is still less than Q. So that's part A. And now let's do B. So S is less than C, and C is less than Q. That's pretty exciting, right? So we're going to do S is equal to um, two Y's this time. 
and we'll do c is equal to three x's. And again, this is just space holders to, to kind of get the idea here. And I'm going to say z is extra weighting. So we're going to need it. So we have t0 and we have t1 and this is time 0. Again, t0 is always going to go first in these ones. So it goes x, x, x and then it goes to sleep. Now when it goes to sleep that is when thread 1 can do its compute. X. Now here's an interesting thing. Thread 0 finishes its sleep while thread 1 is still doing its compute. So does thread 0 preempt thread 1? No, because thread 1 um, hasn't been preempted yet. So what thread, one is or thread 0 is going to have to do is some extra weighting. So we'll do, that's where Z will come into play. And it, thread 0 will only ever get a chance to run once thread 1 has switched to its sleep cycle. And what we'll see here is that thread 1 finishes its sleep while thread 0 is still running. And so it will have to do an extra weight. And that pattern will continue. I see a guess on Twitch about the answer to part B uh, of 2CN plus S. That is correct, but let me show you how to get there for those of you who are not sure how we arrive at that answer. So this continues for some time, and then in our last one, We do that. Okay. So now the question is, how long does this one actually take to run? Okay. Well, let's take a look. So we're going to subdivide things again. What we're going to do is we note that we are taking turns between each of the threads doing their compute. So thread 0 computes thread 1, thread 0, thread 1, thread 0, thread 1. And if you look through this whole cycle here, you'll see exactly that. Thread 0, thread 1, thread 0, thread 1. How many of those are there? where we know that thread 0 does n of them, and we know that thread 1 does n of them. So we do 2n times c computes, and that's just to finish this. And then we just need to know what is the length of the tail. Well, what was left over was the sleep. Hence, you get 2nc plus s. That's not so bad, right? I don't think that's so bad. Now, if you want an extra challenge for at home, why don't you so let's do challenge mode. S is less than C and C is equal to Q over 2. So for the person on Twitch who's asking, what about the first empty slot in T1? It doesn't matter because we've counted that by counting the N computes of T0. So that's already been counted. 
All right, so there's a challenge mode question for you to try to do this with those numbers there, and I make new ones up pretty much every term. Um, another question is, can we expect questions like these to be on quizzes in the future? Yes, it is possible. They may cut show up in the form of multiple choice, or it may show up in the terms of put in a number, except we'll like give you numbers for S, C, and Q. Uh, there are no solutions to the challenge questions because I literally make them up off the top of my head the second we're talking here. Um, if you post your solution to Piazza um, in the, the episode thread, put it in the episode thread, and I will let you know if you're right or wrong, okay? Because I haven't actually worked it out. <laughs> I make up new ends every single term. All right. Now, what I would like to do is... Um, very briefly, for the next maybe five minutes, I would like to open up my browser here and I would like to take you to um, this uh, little tutorial page. Um, and I'll post a link to this later today um, for POSIX threads. So this is something that you're going to need to use for assignment one is POSIX threads or pthreads. Now this should work for you regardless of which operating system you are on because pthreads is cross-platform, so it works in Linux, it works in Mac OS, and it works in Windows. Although Windows is ever so slowly becoming Linux, which is kind of cool. <laughs> I, I'm actually going to make a bet here that probably in 10 years, Windows is just another flavor of Linux. That, that's my bet, actually. So pthreads is actually very simple to use. There's not, I, I will actually post some sample code for pthreads as well. Uh, but you have some examples in the A1. We give you some starter code. You just have to fill it in. And it's literally got like comments in it. Fill in here. <laughs> So pthreads, if you Google this, you will find a lot of documentation because this is probably the most popular threading library used out there. Um, and I just want to show you this little snippet of code and I realize it's probably really small on the screen, so let's make it nice and big. True story is I usually have the code, um, things pretty big on the screen anyway, so I can actually see it. Um, but what you've got here is, so you're going to create, and, and this is user code, you have to create some threads. So you create two thread objects, little structures. Um, this person is going to create two threads. And what you see here is instead of calling thread fork, we use create. In OS 161, we use thread fork to create a thread, but in a lot of threading libraries, they use the word create to actually construct the thread. Um, fork does create a new thread. It's just that they've called it fork instead of create. So we have thread create, and you can see here you pass it the structure. And then just like in OS 161, you have to pass the thread creation function a sequence of instructions. You have to pass it an entry point address. And so you pass it the entry point address as a function pointer. Now what's different between pthreads and OS161 is our threads in OS161 take two arguments uh, for the function pointer. It takes a void pointer where you can pass whatever and an unsigned long. Whereas in pthreads, it just takes a void pointer. Because you can shove everything in a void pointer. Create a structure, shove it through. Do whatever you want. So you've got your entry point address, which is the function pointer. And then you've got the data that you want to pass in. And that's it. Now you have a new thread. And it's going to behave as threads behave in, in the thread. And here's the function down here. So here's the message function. So it's going to, whatever message you pass in, it's going to print it out on the screen. Now, you'll notice here that there's this funny function, th pthread join. In assignment one, you are absolutely banned, forbidden, to use the join function in any way, shape, or form for any reason. And the reason for this is we want you to use other tools to simulate the behavior of join. What join does is so this thread here that's executing the main function, it if it terminates, because it is the primary thread, like the, the main thread, and it calls exit zero, 
if we don't wait for the other two threads to finish, then this program will terminate and it will kill those other two threads before they have possibly even had an opportunity to run. So what we want to do is we want to force this thread to wait for the other two threads to finish. And that is what pthreadjoin does. pthreadjoin thread one is saying, please wait for thread one to finish. And when thread one finishes, we are then gonna call pthreadjoin thread two. Please wait for thread two to finish. <coughs> So that's what join does, is it forces the calling thread to wait, that is sleep, until the other thread has finished. You may not use join for assignment one for any reason. You'll lose a lot of marks. The reason is because the join functionality can actually be simulated using things like semaphores and condition variables and locks, which is the synchronization primitives we will start talking about next week. I do not want you to use join because I want you to do this behavior with the synchronization primitives. I, the point of assignment one is to get you experience creating threads to solve problems, but also get you experience using synchronization primitives to synchronize the threads behavior. So we want you to use the synchronization functions instead of join. Now for all of those lovely synchronization functions that I mentioned, these lovely tutorials will also tell you all about how to use them. Now we, so there's things, and I know we haven't talked about mutexes or locks yet, but there are things like mutexes and locks. There are condition variables, there are semaphores, there are monitors, there are all kinds of different synchronization primitives already implemented for you in pthreads. And so we want you to use those to on, on assignment one as well. And hopefully this will get you just a minimal amount of experience with a real world super popular threading library so that when you are applying for your next co-op terms jobs or when you're doing coding in the future, you'll actually have some real threading experience. All right, so that's P threads in a very brief nutshell. It's easy to use. I'm not gonna lie, this, this is easy. I use OpenMP because I find it even easier. <laughs> There's less code because it's just a couple of uh, preprocessor directives and you're done. Let, let OpenMP figure it out for you. But if you wanted to do some actual proper threading and have a lot of control over things, then pthreads is what you should use. So we recommend you use pthreads. Uh, all right, so in our next episode, we are going to start talking about synchronization, which is how do I stop a bunch of threads reading and writing from the same variable at the same time, which can cause all kinds of havoc as we will see. So before we go, there is a question on Twitch, which is, will you let us know when we've covered enough content to take quiz X? Um, I can put a rough schedule on, um, on Piazza, but it's really rough because like, Right now, because I decide, you, you guys are actually wonderful because you're asking so many questions, and I like that. Um, so we are running about one episode behind the last term, which is totally fine, because we were running way too fast last term anyways. So again, it, I can put a rough guide that might help you. Um, the other thing, of course, you can do is because every... So this is not the only copy of these videos that exists on YouTube. If you actually look at our YouTube channel, you will see there's over a year's worth of 350 episodes. So you can always uh, go ahead. But I can um, post the rough schedule if that would be helpful. Again, it's really rough. But you're also welcome to, to look ahead at anything you want. All right. So we will see you next week. And we will start talking about... Um, Synchronization. And another question then is, do the slides coincide with the slide decks? Yes, yes, they are. They're the same ones, actually. So I, I don't want to have two separate pieces of content. I want to make sure that what we're going over here is what you actually have access to so you can actually, you know, read along. Because otherwise that would be weird. You know. All right. And I know I do a lot of extra, like, samples and stuff. And I will try to remember to post all the extra samples to Piazza as well. Because um, those aren't already published. All right, so we'll see you next week and stick around if you want to see what crazy game I decided to play today. <laughs>